Give me a brief rundown of your scientific background. So I'm an evolutionary biologist. I uh, did my undergrad at UC Davis for my bachelor's of science in evolution, ecology, and biodiversity. Uh, I went to UC Santa Barbara and I got my degree in evolution, ecology, and marine biology, although I didn't study marine biology. That was just sort of tacked on on the, on the degree. Um, I studied animal personalities, like collective personalities of social insects and arachnid societies, which was pretty cool. Hmm. Um, and then I started, so I, I did a postdoc at Penn State for a couple of years. And that's when I started seeing a lot of, I guess, the the what we would call like the sex and gender debates start popping up on, on friends' social media, on the social media accounts of professors and students I was in, making weird claims about the biology of sex, saying things like, you know, didn't you know that there's five sexes or the sex is a spectrum or that it's like a social construct? Uh, and I did some initial pushback on there because part of what I did as an animal behavior scientist is we need to know what biological sex is, the, the fundamental uh, aspect of sex that's rooted in, in gametes. It's a type of reproductive strategy. And we need to know how to identify males, not just in humans, but in in wasps that I studied, in ants that I studied, in spiders that I studied, because the sex of an individual predicts lots of different downstream effects on it, like its body, its behavior, uh, that type of thing. And so knowing the universal fundamental defining property of sex, uh, it was clear that people had a really unclear uh, idea of what sex was. And so initially I just pushed back very politely as you know, scientists trying to act ask them, what do you mean there's five sexes? What do you mean sex is a spectrum or it's a social construct? And instead of getting back the, the scientific arguments, the debates, the evidence, it was just immediately, you're a horrible person, <laughs> you're a transphobe, all this type of stuff. Um, and, and so I just sort of leaned into it since then because part of the reason I became a scientist in the first place is so I could talk about true facts of biology. Uh, at least I, th I thought that's what we were all, all there for. Um, and then I, I, I was getting more and more pushback and I, d I just decided to like, keep leaning into it and write some popular articles for, for Colette early on that went super viral. And then I just kind of became a go-to person to talk about the biology of sex because nobody else was talking about it. And so five, six years later, I'm still talking about it. And, uh, hmm. yeah, and here we are. I think for, for most people, um, even listening to people who are not experts in their field like everybody listening to this now or watching this now they they do their job whatever it is and they're an expert in it because that's why they do their job and there's nothing more frustrating than hearing from people who don't do their job and aren't experts in their field whatever it might be that they know better than you and they're just coming did i mean did it just did it really piss you off yeah i mean you can see what the activists are saying on it and there's a there's a pure sort of ideological underpinning to what they're saying uh, when I initially got into it, it was just some people are wrong about the biology of sex, and I'm going to just correct them in a very academic way. And then when I looked under the hood a bit more, it's clear that, well, what's what's buttressing their arguments, if you can call them that, isn't evidence and reason. It's all this ideological baggage that's underneath it. That's um, They view it as sort of the civil rights cause rather than just a statement of fact about what the biology of sex are, what makes an individual an organism, male or female. Um, and so hearing a lot of people, you know, you get anthropologists that talk about it, like these cultural anthropologists uh, who just are the worst on this topic completely. You get medical doctors who talk about the biology of sex, but they they have sort of a pragmatic way that they approach the biology of sex where they try to to put it in these different layers, these different levels, where they'll talk about chromosomal sex or your hormonal sex or your the, the gametes that you produce. And there's like a pragmatic reason they do this because they're doctors, they need to diagnose illnesses and problems. And so they sort of look at sex and sex related traits on like a, on a hierarchy of, of causation. Because if you're a biological male, you have testes, you produce sperm, but for some reason your testosterone is really low. Uh, that could be because you have testicular cancer or something like that. So doctors will will sort of look at sex in this sort of layered system, even though sex itself is not layered. It's it's There's the causes of sex, there's what sex is, and then there's sort of downstream consequences of sex, which, you know, there's a lot of variation between males and females, not just in humans, but uh, in every animal uh, and plant that there is. So it, it's, it's disheartening seeing sort of an activist takeover of a lot of the sciences and the people who should be pushing back the ones who are experts in this area 
are just kind of kind of uh, been, been cowed into silence because they don't want to push back. They see what happens when people speak up about this stuff, and it is they'd much rather just continue on getting their grants and doing their their lab work. I suppose, I mean, we're going to talk in the second half of this about evolution as well. So the problem of magical thinking, I suppose, on the right, when people, uh, we have, we'll, we'll talk about Tucker Carlson and, and what he said. Um, but I suppose, is it no surprise that this would also happen on the left, just a different version of it? Because humans are humans, whatever side you are on politically, and we're always going to do some magical thinking. I think that's right. So I, I started so back when I was, before I became an evolutionary biologist, when I was still a student, I ran a blog. It was called Warm Little Pond. It was from Darwin's talking about the origin of life. He's like sort of hypothesized uh, that it could have started in a warm little pond somewhere. Uh, and I was mainly interested in debunking a lot of the creationist and intelligent design arguments about evolution, um, mainly because... I just think it's it's harmful, but you know, at an individual and a societal level, if we're denying fundamental truths about biology, you know, things that are absolutely true. We can't know a lot about medicine, um, about our behavior, if we're not taking evolution into account. So that was I dedicated so much time to just debunking these arguments. It's actually why I became an evolutionary biologist in the first place. I found myself just reading papers and textbooks about evolutionary biology, and then hmm. I just got obsessed with the topic, and then I just became an evolutionary biologist. Um, and while I was doing that, you know, my colleagues were very happy to see me pushing back against uh, the creationists, the intelligent design people. Um, and I would also try to debunk things like uh, uh, so alternative medicines, the ones that's, that's, that aren't based in, yeah. in science and stuff like that. All, all sort of like quackery, I guess, if what you want to crawl it. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then when I saw this whole sex spectrum sex is a social construct stuff to me i was just criticizing another new type of sex pseudoscience or biology pseudoscience that was out there um but instead of beating the support of my colleagues since this was an idea that's mainly coming out of left-wing circles uh this was it was just this sacrosanct belief they would they wouldn't allow it to be criticized um where i'm just trying to not play tribes i'm just trying to criticize pseudoscience wherever I see it, and using my same approach, just trying to be very calm and measured and explain to people why I think they're wrong and be w being willing to to receive pushback and have a back and forth uh, on these topics as well. What's, I think what's really sad is that if we, we know that if we all stood up and just said what most people think about biological reality, there wouldn't be a problem anymore. I've been cancelled now. I've been disinvited. I've not been able to speak about it properly yet, but from several book festivals and bookshops and for, for doing, you know, to, to sell my book, it's got nothing to do with the culture wars, my book, The Psychology of Secrets, uh, but because of things I've said about gender and trans. So that's still happening in 2024, even though it does seem to have calmed down a little bit, the whole, you know, I think more and more, more and more rational people are coming out of the woodwork. But we know from history the banality of evil. We know like a lot of it comes from people just not speaking up. And I just I, I just want to encourage anyone listening and watching, like I, I don't want anyone to get fired because of what I say. But at the same time, if we all do it at once, you know, if, if the festivals the festivals don't fire me really because they care about gender, they care about getting bad press. Well, if they got worse press from cancelling people, and if they continue to get bad press from cancelling people for expressing views about biolog biological reality, then they, they wouldn't have they wouldn't be incentivized to 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 cancel us anymore. What is a what is a steel manning of, of a, a man can be a, a woman? I mean, I suppose there are. If you think about it, you take estrogen. You sort of. I know you can't make your willy into a vagina, or you know. But what's the steel man here? So the the steel man is that. Well, it stems from a misunderstanding of what they have about what the fundamental property of being male or female actually is, hmm. um, and if you don't understand this single nugget of truth, then you're just, you're, you have no anchor. You're just sort of floating freely uh, without any, any tether to reality. So what a male and female are fundamentally, uh, they're different reproductive strategies or evolved reproductive strategies. Males are the evolved strategy of producing many small gametes called sperm. And females are denoted as the sex. And this, again, this is universal across all plants and animals, not just humans. Uh, they're this, the individuals that produce fewer larger gametes or ova or eggs. Um, a hermaphrodite isn't a third sex, they're just individuals who are both male and female. And there's some- 
yeah, they're 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 utilizing both of those reproductive strategies. Uh, this isn't something that's found in humans, but garden snails, um, certain frogs, that type of things. That they mm. they are either simultaneous hermaphrodites. They're producing both the gametes at the same time, or they're sequential. So they're doing sperm at one time and ova at another time. Sometimes it's like a life cycle thing. Oh. Why um, is that? Why does that happen? And it's also, just anyone watching, I, I do apologize for saying that's weird. I don't mean don't mean to offend any <laughs> hermaphrodites watching. Statistically, there probably are some, so I don't mean weird in a horrible way. Just fascinating scientifically. But why does that happen? Um, well, there's like the the mechanisms that can spur this on to happen. So when clownfish, they have this interesting evolved hierarchy where they, you know, they're trying to get access to the anemone. Um, the individual that's in the anemone, it's a very valuable limited resource. Uh, and they're the females that are in, in this anemone. If the female dies, the next male will come up and there'll be a change in their, their hormonal profile. And it'll actually facilitate a, a change in their, their gonadal tissue and they'll change from male irreversibly to female. Uh, it just it just benefits them more as 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 a female uh, having access to those resources than it does being a male in that situation. Mm. Um, and there's this whole dominance hierarchy of males beneath beneath that system. Uh, you see it a lot in fish. It's one one reason is because it's easier as a fish to change your the type of gamete you're producing. You know, fish don't need um, an intromission organ like a penis or anything like that or a vagina. They just need to change some of their their tissue and then they just sort of emit their their gametes into the ocean um it doesn't require a lot of secondary sex characteristics in order to achieve fertilization so it's it's much more simple but once you get like the change going on to land um you know you have females at least if you're a mammal you have you know, you're carrying offspring inside of you so your your bodies are sort of cemented into the role of either male or female because you can't just change all of that uh that anatomy um you know, it, it's it's there and it, it can't just go away just by, you know, turning on some hormones. 